Good morning. We're looking at um, a series called Songs That Soothe. Psalms are Jewish songs. There's five different collections in the 150 psalms that we have as the book of Psalms. So it's five different collections. Different people wrote it. What we're doing, we're looking at six that were written by David. And the, the unique thing about these six is that we understand and know when he wrote them. So they are they have a prelude that indicates David wrote this psalm in this situation. And if there was one situation that we would really like to have David write something about, it is the one that we're going to look at this morning. What do you do when you sin with a capital S? You know, you know, we all sin, but David sinned with a capital S. We're going to see with Bathsheba that he committed adultery, then he had Uriah murdered, tried to cover it all up. And what we have in this, we have Psalm 51, which is what David wrote when he had been uh, corrected, when God sent somebody to rebuke and confront David. <laughs> And so David ended up writing a song, and um, very instructive for us, because the Psalms are, they are vehicles to convey the feelings and attitude of any worshiper in a similar situation. That's what Psalms are for. And so, in terms of relevance, this this morning is incredibly relevant for all of us, because the fact is, all of us deal with sin, and we wonder, how should I come to God? What should I do? I mean, what do you do when you've done something wrong and you come before God? You don't want to blow it off, you you know. But you, yeah. so we're gonna we're gonna learn from David, and then this psalm is is really instructive for us. Um, for times of contrition, um, David was able to express uncomfortable feelings in the Psalms. If you look in the Psalms, there's a there's a broad range of feelings that he expresses: gladness, sadness. Anger, pleasure, and the and the thing about that is, because David was comfortable with feelings, and learned to face feelings, he was able to deal with guilt. Able to deal with guilt. Guilt is, as we'll see, both objective and subjective. You know, if you if you get stopped, running a light, um, and a policeman pulls you over. He says, you're guilty of a crime. You might say, I don't feel guilty. And some of you have done that. (laughs) Some of us (laughs) do different tacks. And we've learned to use that to be able to, anyway. But whether you feel it or not, you're guilty. You know, there's, there's some guilt that is objective. Some guilt is subjective. And that's the problem with dealing with God stuff. Some of the things we feel guilty about we might not should feel guilty about. Some of the things that we do feel guilty, we shouldn't, and it, it, it flips back and forth. The thing that makes this tricky is because our adversary satanizes us. Satanizes us. You know what to satanize means? To accuse. So Satan, the word Satan, it's a verb, means to accuse. And so when I am sataning someone, what I'll do, I will accuse them of something in order to devil them. Devil is another verb. And what that means is to create a rift between people. So what we have, our enemy satanizes us in order to devil us, to drive us from one another and drive us from God. In light of that, since our adversary is really good at that, would you agree with me that it's important to be able to figure out which guilt is from him and which isn't? Because the fact is, your adversary is going to try to make you feel guilty about things you really shouldn't feel guilty about. And maybe not to feel guilty about some things you might. And that's what we'll look at. David was able to express uncomfortable feelings, I think, because he was able to face uncomfortable feelings. Uncomfortable feelings create tension. They create tension. There are things we don't like to feel. Fear, shame, guilt. And some of us, because we don't like to feel these feelings, we're not really good at holding them. Any feeling. When we get a strong feeling, especially a negative one, we tend to hide it. And we try to push that feeling to a place where we don't have to feel it. Some of us have learned that we can use mood-altering chemicals, or we can go on shopping trips, or we can eat something in order to push that uncomfortable feeling away. 
Some of us hide our feelings. Some of us hurl them. And when we have a difficult feeling, we look for somebody to blame. If I feel bad, it must be your fault. You know, so if I, I shouldn't feel bad. And so we, we become good at hiding our feelings or hurling our feelings. But we don't become really good at holding them. Holding them. In order to figure out what is and is not from God, you're going to have to hold the guilt. Some of us don't keep it in our hands long enough to even say. It's in our hands, we're throwing it. Or it's in our hands, we hide it. You know why David was good with this experience? Because David was good with feelings. I think it's important, I was thinking about this. You know what David ends up coming through this thing? It's, it, for my, and when you see what he goes through and what he ended up doing, it's miraculous. It's miraculous. I stand back and I go, how in the world could he do what he did? You know what occurred to me? David was good with feelings. Highs and lows. And that's what the Psalms help us to see. Um, David was pretty good at staying with tension. Why was that? David's security with God. In order to stay with uncomfortable feelings, here's the deal. You have to be secure. Security comes from not from being able to control everything. Some of us, our security is based on my life is like this. Don't touch it. Don't, don't, don't breathe. Don't. Just where I want it. And, and when we try to do that, create everything's got to be just right. It's really hard to be able to pull off, isn't it? It's hard to be able to control everything in such a way that things are where we feel good. We feel comfortable. We don't feel anything bad. We don't feel any fear. We don't feel any foreboding. Our life is controlled. Some of us control our circumstances. Some of us control ourselves. We won't let ourselves have a feeling. I mean, we did a skit once from a Lyle. Uh, Lyle Lots did it. And he was talking about, I hadn't had a feeling for years. Ain't hurt me none. <laughs> yeah. um, David was good with. David was good with tension. My sense is, the church does not help us deal with tension. Church seems to be a place where it's pretended that if you're doing it well and saying it right, you don't have bad feelings. You know what that is? That's a lie. The fact is, you're going to deal with difficult feelings. Here's the question. How good are you at it? David was great at it. He held them. Didn't hide them. Didn't hurl them. Held them. Um, amazing. <clears throat> okay, so we have, it says, verse in the Bible, top verse. I really like this. My people have committed two sins. In fact, I'm going to tell you this. The reason why God wants to create a secure relationship with you is not so that you can move out of tension, but so that you can move into it. When you know that God is with you and there's safety there, you know what you end up being able to do? Feel feelings. The reason why it's tough for us to feel feelings is we feel so isolated by them. We feel so alone. Does anybody feel what I feel? And if we don't do that, we want to push that down. So God wants to create an intimate relationship with you, not so that you can move out of feelings, so you can move into them, so that you can endure them, not eliminate them. Okay, now I'll go on. It says in Jeremiah 2.13, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. Two sins. Number one, dig our own cisterns. Uh, that's what we find with David, a leaking cistern. Look at 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 5. One evening, David got up from his bed, walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent messages to get her. She came to him. He slept with her. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am Pregnant. Hmm. Kind of a confusing situation. Uh, we don't know why David didn't go to war when other kings did. I don't think it's very important. Um, the fact is, relative to dealing with guilt, we can't keep ourselves so busy that we don't fall into sin. Anyways, 
what David ended up doing, Bathsheba got pregnant, so David summoned Uriah, the husband. Kind of a good plan. Said, okay, here's what I'll do. Uriah, great. Hey, nice to see you. Hey, how's the battle going? <laughs> uh, I think you need some R&R. &R, so why don't you go with your wife and uh, have some R&R? &R. And, and so Uriah went out and then slept in the doorway of the palace. Don't! You know, and so... Uh, Okay, uh, David had to go to plan B, and he couldn't get Uriah to go be with Uriah's wife because Uriah's band of brothers was on the battlefront. And so he ended up sending word, a letter, with Uriah, telling Joab, the general, put this guy in the heart of the fighting. And so Uriah passed this note on to Joab, who looked at it, did what David said, put Uriah in the very thick of the battle, and Uriah got killed. All the loose ends tied up, except that God sent Nathan the prophet to speak to David. And I'm just going to read this. Here's what happened. It makes for good listening. Here's, here's a story. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. Remember, David was a shepherd. He's going to get this. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now, a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David heard this story. He burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And Nathan said to David, You are the man. Mm. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, Therefore, the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says, out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You know who that was? He looked at him. Remember Absalom? Tried to do a coup to take the throne? That's what he ended up doing sleeping with David's wives uh, in order to create a rift and, a, and to give strength to the coup. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before our Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. But because by doing this, you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. David committed sin number one, sin number one, which is digging his own cistern. Now, you know what a cistern is? A cistern is a place that it collects rainwater. There's cisterns and there's springs. The, thing, the difference between a spring and a cistern, a spring is an unceasing source of water. A cistern only has as much water as it has collected. You know, and if this is a cistern-like pond out here, it, it's not fed, it's, it just Fed with runoff, that's why we didn't get a lot of rain this past year, and the water level went down, down, down. That's what a cistern is like. It only holds what it collects, and what it says, we dig cisterns, not only cisterns that capture, but cisterns that leak. Now, I don't think the deal here is a leak. I think there just wasn't enough water, it evaporated, but sometimes cisterns leak, and then the water leaches out of the cistern and, and goes into the ground. And what 
it says is we commit two sins, and the one is we dig our own cisterns. And that's what Bathsheba was. There's a lot of different kinds of cisterns, places. It's not, it's not bad to be thirsty. Being thirsty is natural. You're thirsty for a lot of things. Security and significance, and all those things are fine. It's when we try to draw resources that can't really meet the need. So when we try to draw security from the cistern of this or that, that's a sin. Hmm, That's interesting, isn't it? That doesn't seem like a sin. But in terms of God's definition, that's what sin is. That's what sin is. It's There's two different kinds. It's trying to get spring-level resources. I'm sorry, trying to meet spring-rated needs. Spring-rated, one that we need a continual flow. Spring-rated needs, trying to get that from a cistern-rated source. So what that means, we need to be loved, and we hold another person accountable to love us to the degree we need to be loved. That's drawing a spring-rated need from a cistern-rated resource. The fact is, there's not a person with flesh and blood that can love you as much as you need to be loved. Not enough to keep you from feeling afraid. What it says, perfect love drives out fear. And the person you're married to or that birthed you isn't perfect in that. That's one kind of sin, and David did that. The thing that he didn't do is another kind of sin. We forsake the spring of living water. Now, here's what happens. David gets to this place. And what would you do? I can't. I, this astonishes me. So he gets this thing, and then <clears throat> we're going to find out, well, let's find out what he does. And he ends up then, after Nathan leaves, at that point, he must have written Psalm 51. Let's read it. We read it, and you follow along. You see what it says. This is what David writes after Nathan rebukes him. <clears throat> and if, you, if you're looking for, if there were sound effects with this, you know what sound effects I would have with this? Gulping. Somebody so thirsty, gulping cool water. Just Their spirit is parched. And you know how sometimes when you're really thirsty, it's like you, you just can't get it down fast enough. And that's what you hear. David drinks in water. Listen to what he says. Amazing. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, And my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create a pure heart. In, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. How many I am going to speak? In, in those days, the Holy Spirit was not given as a an abiding presence. That's the difference between New Covenant and Old Covenant. In those days, the Spirit was given as a dispensation to help leaders do what they needed to do. So the Spirit comes upon this person, and he's able to have the influence that God wants him to have. But it was something that you couldn't always have, and that's why David said, don't take your Spirit from me. In those days, that could happen. In these days, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Sonship, and it's not an in-and-out kind of thing. Anyways, um, it says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. 
Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, full burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. A couple things in verse 1 blot out my transgressions. In those days, you wrote stuff on a scroll. And the way you erased stuff from a scroll is you washed it. A scroll was made of animal skin. And so what you do then, it, you don't get an eraser. It, you just take water and pour it on it. And, and doing so... Uh, liquefied the ink. You know, this makes sense. You know, we have papers. We write on them with ink. Sometimes they get wet and the stuff just goes. But with a, with a scroll, it, it removes it. it. removes it. So when he says, uh, blow out my transgressions, that's what he's depicting. His transgressions are written on a scroll and, and blot them out as wash them. Pour water on them so that they're completely gone. That's what that means. Uh, wash away all my iniquity. This is a different word for washing. In those days, you didn't clean garments with soap. What you did is you, you made a garment wet, and then you beat it on a rock. You pounded it. And, and that's the image here, that David's sin is in his clothes. And what he's asking God to do, take my sin and just pound it on rock so that, that the sin is gone from it. I know my transgressions, verse 3, and my sin is always before me. Before is to stand boldly against. It's, it's in opposition to. And David says, I have, I know what I did. <laughs> Again, that's oftentimes our deal, isn't it? It's not that we don't know what we did. It's that sometimes we have trouble facing the feelings that come from remembering it. And David understood that. Um, Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Really? Rebuild a firm, stable spirit. Look what he says, verse 16. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. It's not that, that David didn't practice these things, because what he ends up saying later is, then we'll bring you sacrifices. Here's what David understood. You can't do a ritual to really take care of the spirit of the matter. You can't just take an animal, and David understood this. Even though in the law it said, you know, you can slit the throat of the animal for unintentional sin. And I think that might have been David's thing. He goes, you know what? I can't kill an animal because I didn't do this sin unintentionally. And so he doesn't pretend. What he says is, that's not going to work for me. And here's what he knew, though. He didn't feel abandoned. He goes, and you know what? Here's the deal, God. If, if rituals could really do it, I would do a ritual. I would do whatever you want, but what I know is that's not going to work because where you want clean is not outside but inside. And what David said, I know that I've had a sin problem since I was a fetus. And you need to make me clean in the inside place. So I can't get that clean by doing a ritual. And some of us understand what that means. I'm not very ritualistic here. I grew up in a church that was pretty ritualistic. And did the confession, went to an individual, and there's, yeah. And sometimes that seemed okay, but you can start to depend. You know what it felt like? It felt like going through a car wash. You know the old car washes where you didn't stand still, the car moved. So the old car washes, I remember somebody that's going to date me, is they kind of hook you on to this chain. You remember this? And the chain pulled you through the car wash. The, the water in that stuff was stationary. And so you would go in, clunk, you know, you'd have to get your, your wheels up on that little track, and then it, and you see, it pulls you through. That's what church felt like. You know, you get dirty during the week, then you walk in, and then you get hooked up. <laughs> then, you, then you come out, you know what, but it kind of felt good. Then you kind of were clean and sparkly. Uh, our clients, cars don't really stay clean and sparkly very much if you go to church here, do they? <laughs> you notice that? It's, it's really hard to keep a car wash. Um, but David understood that that, <clears throat> that really didn't work. Um, that's why he says in verse 19, 
In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Here's what David's saying. Yeah, let's do the sacrifices. Let's do the sacrifices once we've taken care of things. There were different things. What David didn't go for is whitewash. There's a place in the Bible. Here's what it says. Ezekiel. And God confronts the nation. Here's what he says. The officials within her, Israel, are like wolves tearing their prey. They shed blood and kill people to make unjust gain. So he's saying the, the, the officials, the leaders of Israel are predators, monetary, materialistic predators. And here's what it says about the clergy. Her prophets whitewash these deeds for them by false visions and lying divinations. You know what whitewash is? It's like when I have a wall that needs rebuilding. And so, like, say I'm in Jerusalem, and the wall has huge cracks, but I don't want to fix the crack. I just want to make it look like the crack is fixed. So what I'll do, I won't do the stuff of infrastructure. I'll just take a coat of plaster and put it on the outside. See? looks like a complete wall. And what David understood is that even though there were people that did that, that that doesn't work. Whitewashing things doesn't work very well, does it? Whitewashing things doesn't work. And David wouldn't do that. If he wanted a solution, he wanted something that would work. Um, so here's what he does. He writes this psalm, connects with God, thinks about him, and the results are, well, I want you to imagine, and we're going to read what happens. And you know the story. No, you know. Nathan told David, you're going to have problems in your family. And in fact, the kid that Bathsheba born is going to die. So here's what you did. You slept with Bathsheba, killed her husband. Then the child, you learn is sick. Now, what's going to happen? David's going to hear this stuff. The child is going to die. And we're going to see what David would do. What would you do? What would you do? I think, what would I do if you did that stuff? I'm not sure I could live with myself. The, the, the feeling, the, the guilt would be so overwhelming. Some of us have a terrible time with guilt. Look what it says. Interesting. After Nathan had gone home, and this is in your, is this in your thing? Yeah, it's on the back side, isn't it? It's on the back of the, the sheet. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, seventh day of this, so he's prostrate for a week, I'm not going to eat anything, and just lay before God for a week. Um, the seventh day, the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, we spoke to David, but he wouldn't listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. You know what they're thinking? He's going to off himself. Then we're going to be in a mess. David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves. And he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house. And at his request, they served him food, and he ate. His servants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat? He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Kind of an interesting promise for those who lost young ones. 
I will go to him. I will go to him. So he won't come to me. Hmm. Then David then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and lay with her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. Look what it says in the end of verse 24. Look at those words. This is a child born of an affair. What does it say? And the Lord loved him. And because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedediah. This kid's going to be Jedediah. So Solomon's other name was Jedediah. And you know what Jedediah means? Loved by the Lord. Here's my question. Did God want David to continue to feel real bad? If David had continued to feel real bad, would he have worshipped God? Would he have gotten something to eat? Would he have comforted Bathsheba? Would he have had the opportunity to bring Jedediah into the world if he was stuck in guilt? The answer is, why are you still stuck? Why are you still stuck? That thing you you'd really don't want to think about. That sin you commit, Ted, commit. Why, why do we get stuck? Do you think God wants us to continue to feel guilty? To continue to beat ourselves up? Is that what he wants? Again, fair question, isn't it? Isn't that what contrition is about? Feeling so bad about something that, well, in this case, and again, we're going to have to talk about this, but I don't, God did not want David to continue to deal with guilt feelings. If David continued to be miserable, would he ever have comforted Bathsheba? The answer is no. No. He would have made sure that the last person in the world he wanted to see was Bathsheba. See, that's what some of us do. We hide things inside, and then because we hide things inside, we can't go places because it reminds us of the thing we're trying to hide. And we have to limit where we go because we're not good at dealing with the feeling and therefore we need to stay away from places that trigger the feeling. And we think it's your fault. You made, no, no. We have to learn to deal with the feelings. And David could do that. He learned it. He dealt with the feeling through contact. And because there's some things he knew about God. Next slide. Question. Why does God forgive sins? I tell you the first thing, not because we feel bad, there is something that cleanses sins, and it's not tears. What can wash away my sins? The blood of Jesus. It, it puts us from an old to a new covenant. And so just, so, just so you know, when you confess your sins, and it, you really don't have to dr drudge up a lot of affect in order to come to the place, well, I really felt bad enough. Jeez, doggone it, I think God's going to forgive me. Forget it. Your tears are not the price of forgiveness. You're not going to do it. So feel bad, but don't rely on feeling bad in terms of being forgiven. Some of you, when you confess your sins, it's this thing that you have to drudge up a bunch of pain. You know, in fact, you might take your finger and pluck a few nose hairs. <laughs> Just dragged right out of me. No idea where that came from. Not because of our feelings. We're not forgiven because of our feelings. Next, we're not forgiven because of our promises. We're not forgiven because of our promises either. Um, there's a passage, Hosea 6. It says this, um, Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. And so what the people were saying, okay, tell you what, we did wrong things. Let's promise God we'll never do it again. Ne we're never going to do that again. And you know what God ends up saying to us? It's really great. 
great thing. What can I do with you? <laughs> what can I do with you? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Uh, and what he's saying is, oh, yeah, the feelings are good. They're real, but they're like fog. You know, so your, your, your promises are like the fog that shows up at 7. By 9 o'clock, what's the deal? Gone. <laughs> and, it, and, you know, it's real enough when it's 7 a.m. But God understands that 9 a.m. is coming. 10 a.m. is coming. Therefore, he says, it's not about your promises. So when you're confessing your sin, don't say, and by the way, God, I will never do that again. He says, what am I going to do with you? Save me. It's not because it's not based on that. It's not about our feelings or our promises. You know what it's about? It's about his promises. It's about his promises. It's because he is faithful and just. Well, look what it says. 1 John chapter 1. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John chapter 1 verse 8. In verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This, path, this, this verse is used to say, okay, and some people think unconfessed sin is not forgiven. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But if we don't confess our sins, what's going to happen? Not going to confess. And you know what the deal is with this? There's a couple things we need to know. The word confess here is not private. It's public. That's the word for confess. It's the word used if I am the emperor and I am parading down through, confess Caesar is Lord. And it's not that you would say, okay, wait just a minute. I'm going to get down on my knees here. It's not private confession. It's I go down the middle, and what you need to say is out loud, Caesar is Lord. That's the word for confess here. It's not a private confession. Now, I'm not blowing up private confession, but that's not what this is talking about. It's talking about public confession. See, the problem here is not that people aren't confessing their sins privately. It's that they're denying that they're sinners publicly. See, isn't that, look what it says in verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, do you know why he says that? It's because some people are claiming to be without sin. That's what this passage is talking about. Some people in this church are claiming to be without sin. And what he says, if you deny that you're a sinner, Jesus is not going to do anything for you. Acknowledge that you have a sin problem. And it says that he is faithful and just. To forgive. Wouldn't you imagine, you know, when you look at this, God's forgiveness rises from not his mercy here, not his mercy, but his justice. Question. In what way does God's justice give birth to forgiveness? He is faithful and just. Isn't that what it says? He's faithful and just to forgive sins. So if God's going to forgive you, it's not because he says, okay, I see that you feel bad enough. I'll give you five bucks worth of forgiveness. Doggone it. This is the last, this is the last five spot of forgiveness you're going to get from me. Okay, here it is. Now, don't come to me again for this. Sometimes we feel that way with God, that we kind of presume upon him. And, and we come the next day. Remember that five dollars worth of forgiveness that I got yesterday that I said I'd never need again? I just I need another five spot. You see, it's it's not that God doesn't forgive sins because of us, he forgives sins because of him, because he's faithful and just to faithful and just to what? Here's what he says. He promised to forgive be Helios to our wickedness and to remember our sins no more. He's for, he's faithful to that. Here's what he did. God always keeps his covenant promises. He promised that he would be Helios to, which is in response to sins, gracious, benevolent, favorable, cheerful. So when you sin, God doesn't go, that's it. That's it. He doesn't do that. How can you know that God will forgive you? He promised to be Helios to your transgression. See, we look at what we do. And we imagine God feels the same way. Or there are people around us that when we do bad things really put guilt trips on us. 
and we assume that God looks at us the same way. In fact, we tend to see God through the eyes of those around us, maybe spiritual leaders, and we feel guilty for things that God doesn't want us to feel guilty for. In fact, he's saying, why don't you believe that I forgive you? David did. Here's a question. You think Jesus' sacrifice wasn't enough? See, some of you are really caught. And you think, God's never going to forgive me. I'm going to be a little bit direct with you. Do you know how arrogant that is? Again, you feel, I can't believe that God forgives me. Stop being so arrogant. He says, I will forgive your wickedness and will remember your sin no more. You know what your job is? Believe it. Why aren't you believing this? Why? And again, I'm not, you know what I mean, because I'm not dumping on you because I'm in the same spot. He's not stuttering here. And you know what? Why God is faithful and just to forgive you? Because he promises to. Hmm. In fact, he says, I'm going to be Helios to your wickedness. You're stuck in sin. And you know what the deal is? God's not stuck there. He's looking to the future. He's not stuck on that thing. In fact, you know what I think he would want you to, you know what to confess is to say the same thing as. What about this? Okay. You're looking for something to confess when you sin. Tell God about the wrong thing that you did. But confess the new covenant realities, which are these. And I tell you to do that. I do this. You're still in me because he puts his law on our heart and writes it on our mind. You're still in me. You're still with me. Good's still ahead of me. Guaranteed. I blew that. You're still in me. You're still with me. Good's still ahead of me. Guaranteed. Can you say that after me? You're still in me. You're still with me. Good's still ahead of me. Guaranteed. I want you to think about that thing you did last night. I want you to think about that thing that you watched online. I want you to think about the way you treated that person last week. I want you to think about the way that you've responded to your parents this year. I want you to think about the thing you did at work. That thing. And I want you to think about and say this after me. You're still in me. You're still with me. Good's still ahead of me. Guaranteed. I want you to say it like you mean it. Like you mean it. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's an abortion. I don't care it's I don't care what it is. You're still in me. You're still with me. Good's still ahead of me. Guaranteed. You know what that is? Confession. Saying about your sin what God says about it. And he's faithful to forgive your wickedness and remember your sins no more. And you know what happened with David? Well, David understood this. When he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, have mercy on me is to bent and stoop in kindness to an inferior. And unfailing love is really covenant faithfulness. It's covenant faithfulness. You know why David, David was be able to do? And we're going to sing a song as we close. Come on up, Joel. He understood God. He gazed at God and glanced at his sin. And if you glance at your sin, look at it. Because we need to take inventory. David didn't look away from this whole thing. He looked at it, but he didn't gaze at it. He looked at it, but he glanced at his sin. He gazed at God. And I don't know if it was these exact words, but I know that his spirit was, you're still in me. You're still with me. Good's still ahead of me, guaranteed. As we bow, some of you might be thinking, uh, come on, Mike, will you? You know, sin is serious, and it is serious. And, um, and obedience is, it matters. Uh, what the Bible says is that obedience is to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And what the Bible says, there is no fear in love, and perfect love drives out fear. 
Fear cannot generate the obedience that God requires of us. Fear cannot generate the obedience that God desires of us. Fear cannot generate the obedience God desires from us. Only love can. Love is based in security. <coughs> Father, I pray that we would grab your promises of forgiveness assertively, not passively. Grab them and embrace them with some heat, with some intensity. Serious about it. Belief is a big thing. You have not stuttered relative to the reality of forgiveness, and I pray that we would not be hesitant to embrace what you tell us to embrace, to internalize what you tell us. Again, it's, it doesn't happen overnight, but I, we really do. I would really like us to, to continue to head in the direction of claiming things that you tell us to claim, because in that place will be the people you want us to be. So continue to work in us. We do want to be the men and women that you want us to be, loving to you, ourselves, and others. Help us to embrace forgiveness so that we'll get to that place. In Jesus' name, amen.